Hey, uh, thanks for, for letting me come out here and, and uh, hang out with you guys today. My name is Lauren. Like Chip said, we uh, uh, came out on a mission trip, uh, not mainly because I chose to, but because our church wouldn't let us, uh, our college group, do international missions. They said, you got to do something in the States because it costs too much money to send people out. We're in a building phase. You need to do something local. So we found something local. We came to Utah, and uh, it changed, changed my life. It was amazing. So, um, man, I didn't have a heart for Mormons, and that wasn't a thing that I it was really, uh, a part of my life. I mean, I knew about uh, Mormon people and uh, the LDS church, but it wasn't something that I was passionate about by any means. Uh, but when I came, um, we just saw how is it that there's a place in America that has so many uh, ch cities in them that don't have a Christian church in them. I just sort of assumed that there would be predominantly Mormons here, but that there would be kind of a undercurrent of evangelical Christianity like there is in every other place, even secular places within America. You'll find Christian churches uh, there. You'll find pockets of that. And we just drove through these places, city after city, that didn't have a Christian church in them, and it changed changed uh, my world. I remember uh, call, calling my wife. My wife was pregnant with our, with our, our first son, so she stayed home for that trip. Uh, that first trip out here and I remember calling her and just telling her uh, what I'm seeing like we're driving through these places and there's no Christian churches in them and, and uh, how is this possible we're in America like I thought there was there's churches everywhere and uh, I remember getting off the phone with her and she she well I don't remember this but she told her friend uh, she said I think we're moving to Utah <laughs> and, uh, and uh, and I hadn't thought about that, I hadn't said anything about it, but she could just sort of hear in my voice there's something different about the way I was describing what I was seeing. And uh, so uh, we sort of set, you know, a couple years later, or a couple trips later, we sort of set a 10-year plan of, of coming to Utah and planting a church. And six months later, we were here in Utah and uh, starting, our, starting our church, starting a church. Uh, so I'm the pastor of the Bridge Community. It's the church up in Centerville, just a little bit north of, um, of Salt Lake City. And the uh, Lord's been good. We have an amazing church, and I uh, love the people there. We have, uh, um, there's seven people in my small group that are all coming out of Mormonism right now. And uh, uh, we had one of them made a profession of faith just a, just a, a month or two ago. And uh, his wife is, is on that similar um, trajectory, and, and there's others as well that have already come to faith. And so uh, just a really neat, really neat thing that's going on. Um, Oh, up there, but I'm not going to talk about that because uh, that would take too much time. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, a chapter in the book that, that we, uh, Chip was just describing, this, uh, sharing the good news with Mormons that uh, Eric Johnson um, kind of spearheaded getting, getting, getting people. Uh, I, I, when I came out, when I that, took that first mission trip here, it, it changed my life in a couple ways. One of those was I uh, decided to come and move to, to Utah to plant a church. The second part that changed my life was I was a part of a ministry program and um, uh, a doctor of ministry. I changed my research to be oriented around uh, Mormonism and on specifically on the, uh, the notion of grace within the Mormon church. And so uh, I ended up finishing that, the, my, my work on that and uh, that, that informs a lot of what uh, is in my chapter of, of the book. And so I want to share a little bit of insights uh, from understanding Mormon grace, because I think uh, what's important to me about that is uh, if I'm going to share the gospel with, a, with an LDS person. How many of you guys, this is your first time here in Manti? Man, so many of you. Praise God. What an amazing thing. Um, if you've had a chance to share the gospel yet, or if you get that chance tonight, wherever, wherever that happens, uh, you'll notice that if you haven't already been alerted to this, that you'll say things and they hear you, but they're interpreting what you're saying through a different kind of lens, right? They, they can hear, they, they use the same words that you use, but they mean something different by it. And so I found, I was getting really frustrated my first couple years at Manti and, and even once we moved here and, and uh, you know, we're sharing the, our faith with people that they would hear what we were saying and they would just sort of nod and agree with everything. And we're like, how are you, you don't believe the same things I believe. So how are you agreeing with everything? And a lot of it has to do with uh, they use the same words that we use. And so as, even as we're preaching the gospel, they're hearing that a little bit different. So I wanted to try to figure out, so what is grace? When, they, when we're talking about grace within Mormonism, what, what does that look like? And so what I want to do is I want to share with you, uh, my hope today is to share with you two things. One, I want to give you a little bit of background on grace in the Mormon church. And then I want to kind of give you a, an approach to sharing the gospel with a Mormon that I think may be helpful in uh, in, in kind of breaking through kind of that language barrier that we have sometimes. And so that's my, uh, that's my hope. Um, 
uh, what I want to accomplish. And so I hope that the first half of it, which is kind of the background piece, I hope it's not, I don't want to bore you guys, but it is really important so that you have an accurate understanding of what grace is to them so that as you have those discussions and you're talking about grace with them, you can kind of understand and know how to navigate that conversation a little bit. So let me just pray and then we'll, we'll dive right in. Father, thank you for uh, the gift of grace that you give us. God, thank you that you um, delivered us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son you love. What, a, uh, what an amazing truth we have, God, that your love uh, breaks boundaries and walls that separate us and you bring us into fellowship. And, uh, and God, we know that uh, your heart is for the people here that, that you want to reach as well. And so we pray that, Lord, you would equip us and you'd... you'd um, Build us up so that we'd be effective at uh, preaching the gospel, that we would do that and the, the gospel would be heard clearly and, and those that hear it, God, uh, your spirit would be at work to um, move them to, uh, to a place to, uh, to know you as well, God. So we pray for our ministry that goes on tonight, pray for the training today and everything else, God, that you'd use it for your kingdom, for your glory, in your name, Jesus, amen. Uh, I became convicted... Uh, uh, when I was having this, this problem with this language, I guess, uh, the, there's a passage in Romans 10 that says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And, um, and, uh, and as we look at the, uh, Romans 10, it says, but how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who, whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? Uh, and, and, but then he says, and as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. And the truth of the matter is you and I are sent. The, the uh, risen Lord Jesus Christ sends us to bring the message of the gospel to people. And I want them to hear it because I believe in the preaching of the gospel. If they really, if, if LDS people or anybody for that matter, really hears the gospel, uh, that, that the spirit is at work in that to help them come to faith. Now, I think one of the problems is oftentimes there are these language gaps that make it really difficult for them to really hear the gospel rightly. And because they don't hear it right, they don't have, they don't see it as an alternative sometimes or difference uh, because they're interpreting it sometimes in the ways that they, already sort of understand grace. And so I want to walk through some useful background info. I think that'll help uh, understand a little bit more what, what they're thinking about when we think about grace. So I want to talk about the fall and, uh, and Adam and Eve and that just for a minute because it helps us understand what the problem is for the Mormon that, that needs grace. Uh, and it's a little bit different than what you and I think about. I'm not even going to get into the difference and understanding of the fall. Uh, you, can, you can look into that on your own time, but you should understand that they don't see the fall the same way that we do. Uh, for them, it's a mainly a, a beneficial thing. In, in a lot of sense. And we'll see a little bit of that here. But here's, here's um, four things that are true about humanity uh, prior to the fall in LDS theology. Uh, first of all, they believe that humans were immortal. They would never die. And that's sort of a problem because uh, you have to be able to die in order to progress to that next, um, uh, the next state. And so they're sort of stuck in this... Um, in this mortality, they're immortal. They're not going to die and be able to progress. So there's a little bit of a problem there. They're also what, what we call maybe innocent in the sense that they don't have at this point before the, the fall, they don't have agency. It's a big word for Mormons. If you've talked with them, they probably use that term sometimes. They don't have agency. Agency for the Mormon is uh, if, you, if they don't have agency at this point, they have no capacity for good or evil. They have no capacity also for joy and sorrow. And so they're kind of in this uh, weird state where they can't be joyful, they can't be sad, they can't do good, they can't do bad. They're just sort of there. And they're there. They have no uh, real hope for progression at this point because they're stuck in their mo in mortality. Uh, they also have an intimate relationship with God. You remember, similar to how we would understand things, God sort of hangs out with them in the cool of the day. You know, God shows up and they have this intimate relationship with God. Uh, but they were also, in Mormon thought, incapable of multiplying. And this is the pastor in me. I was able to make these four eyes. So you got four eyes here. <laughs> they were incapable of multiplying. Um, they, they couldn't have kids. And of course, if you understand the whole thing of the preexistence, this is a problem because there's a lot of spirit babies that need to get born. And, and so they, they can't uh, help with that at this point before the fall. So, uh, so they have these... Uh, these things are true about them. Some of them are okay, but most of these things are kind of problematic. And God gives them some commands. He says, don't eat of the tree. But he also says, but, uh, have, be fruitful and multiply. And they're kind of in the stuck zone because they can't be fruitful and multiply. 
and uh, they can't have kids yet. And so they kind of have to figure out how are we going to prioritize these commands that God gives us to not eat of the tree, but we also know if we eat of the tree, then we can have kids and we can have, you know, spirit baby thing and all that kind of stuff. So uh, they, they choose, uh, in, in terms of LDS thought, they choose wisely and, and they eat of the fruit and that changes some things. Um, those four eyes each change and uh, they change in, in, in these ways. First of all, they become... Adam and Eve were now are now mortal. That means they'll die, which is great because that allows for the possibility of progression. They also now have agency. They have the capacity for good and evil, joy and sorrow. They, uh, but they do experience a distancing from God, and that's uh, that's a little bit of a problem now. God doesn't hang out with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day like he had before. And they also now become descendant capable. They can now have babies, and that that gives us mad. So that's what happens. They become mad. <laughs> You like that? That's bonus points. I feel like I should get an award for that, but not yet. So you kind of see there's a couple of thing, effects. So the effects of the fall, uh, there's some, they could kind of, these four things that happen to them, you can put them into different categories. There's some negative effects. Uh, mortality, the problem with mortality at this, play, at this point is that if they die, they just stay in the grave. They're just dead. Okay. The other problem is now they have this distant relationship with God. But there are positive effects. Like we talked about, now they have agency. And because of agency, they have the ability through their obedience to uh, potentially raise up uh, and, and, and be exalted. They also now have, can have kids. And so that's helpful because they can, you know, uh, God's spirit kids can, can progress as well. And, and so the problem is that they're, they're, uh, they're stuck in the grave and, uh, and they kind of have this, distance, this distant relationship with God. And not only them, but all their kids are going to have the same kind of problem. And, and, and Mormonism does not like the idea that Adam's sin affects you negatively. They don't like that idea. So w w one of the ways that they, that they see this change is they think that through the atonement of Christ, which it's, it's another whole topic, talking about what they mean by atonement. I'm not going to get into that right now. But uh, the atonement of Christ, his, his you know, suffering and death and all that, all that uh, and his resurrection and all that stuff that goes on um, it changes things for us. It changes those negative effects of the fall. And, uh, and, and, and universally and unconditionally heals those negative effects for all of humankind. Um, so, and that is an act of grace. That is a, a thing that God, a gift that God gives, that he gives to every human. It doesn't matter if you want it or not. He, uh, universally, unconditionally, he will heal your problem that you're going to die and stay in the grave. And he will heal that distant relationship. And he does that through the resurrection. So Jesus raised, is raised from the dead. And so in the same way, they believe that you also will be raised from the dead. And that fixes that problem of being dead and staying in the grave because now you have a life after this. They, they fix that, uh, that, that problem of being distant with God by bringing you back into God's presence. Even if it's just for judgment, you will still stand before God again. And so, in their mind, this is grace. And so, this is what Jeffrey Holland says. Uh, Some gifts coming from the atonement are universal, infinite, unconditional. These include his ransom for Adam's original transgression, so that no member of the human family is held responsible for that sin. So, the negative effects of the fall are healed universally and unconditionally for all of humankind. And this is an act of grace that God gives. It's something you don't have to earn. You can't get away from it. It's yours whether you want it or not. All right. Uh, so those, those negative effects are, are fixed through unconditional grace, through uh, resurrection. Go one more for me. I don't know if you can read that. I, uh, anyway, the, their moral, the, the problem of mortality is fixed by, uh, through the resurrection. And um, their distant relationship with God is, is fixed by bringing us into God's presence, even if it's just for judgment. On the positive side, agency is, is, a, is, a, is a, a good and a bad um, it, it's, it's mainly thought of in a good way. One more for me. I don't know if you're going to read this or not, but basically agency is going to allow for obedience because now you can choose good or evil. It's going to, going to allow for obedience, which uh, can, if we're obedient, qualify a person for eternal life, but it also makes disobedience possible. And this is the problem. And, and through humans' disobedience, uh, sometimes that's called uh, spiritual death or damnation because it's going to stop your progression, your ability to to progress. In, in, in LDS theology, God heals that problem as well. He's going to overcome your spiritual death, but he does that conditionally. Conditionally. And that's kind of the, becomes a, a, the crux of it. When you start asking, 
well, what, what are the conditions? Uh, if, you've, if you've looked in the chapter in the book or you have other resources um, that, that deal with the impossible gospel, the, the conditions are impossible. And this is the problem. To get the, 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 uh, the, the benefits of the atonement, uh, some benefits of the atonement are universal and unconditional that affect all the negative side. But my own spiritual death due to my sin is healed, but only conditionally. And that's, that's where the big problem hits, because once you read those conditions, which I'm not going to go into that right now, you can look in uh, Keith's stuff, you can look at his things for a better uh, walkthrough of, of what those um, conditions might be and how impossible they are, but that's kind of the problem. It's, it's only conditional. And so Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, he, he, Doctrines of Salvation, he says, redemption from the original sin is without faith or works. So that's the universal and unconditional part. It's without faith or works. Redemption from our own sins is given through faith and works. Both are gifts of free grace, which I don't think he understands the term. If it's conditional, it's not, a, it's not free grace. But there you go. Uh, they, but again, they use, the, they use the words that we'll use. It's free grace. Yeah, 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 free grace. I got it. Uh, but for them, free grace is conditional, at least on this, the, the spiritual death from your agency stuff. Uh, but while one gift is forced upon us unconditionally, the other one is a gift merely offered to us conditionally. Merely offered conditionally. So... Um, so the types of grace, if you're going to talk to a Mormon about, and you're going to talk to them about grace, did you want a picture of that, that slide? I'll give you back there for a second. There's three kinds of grace that, that you might talk about with, a, with an LDS person. There are three things that they might be thinking about. So you want to try to help figure out. And, and Christians, we do this too. Like We don't only have one type of grace that we talk about. We talk about God's grace in giving us strength to endure something difficult, or we talk about His grace in helping us in various circumstances along with saving grace. So this isn't unique to Mormonism, but, but I do want to highlight the three things that they typically mean. On the one hand, they might be talking about the unconditional grace that God gives to all universally unconditionally. Um, you, they, they might also be talking about conditional grace, the, the kind of grace that God gives us to heal our spiritual death due to our sin that comes to us conditionally which I don't think is actually grace, but that's the term they give it anyway. Or they might be talking about, and typically what a Mormon is talking about when they talk about grace, is the, is the enabling grace that God gives us. And Protestant Christians, evangelicals, will talk about enabling grace as well. But for them, what enabling grace does is, is through our sin, if you think about, us, if you think about our, our obedience as sort of a, walking up a, a stairway that God gives us that, that, that potentially leads to exaltation, God, in His grace, allows for that stairway to exist or that pathway for us to reach exaltation. Well, our sin kind of messes, breaks the staircase. It, doesn't, it, it stops our ability to progress. What God's enabling grace does is sort of fix the staircase so that we can walk our way back up. But it's still up to you to, to, to walk up the stairway. It's still up to you and through your obedience and, and through all the different ordinances and all that kind of stuff. So his enabling power, uh, Robert Millett says, he's, one of the, he's a uh, BYU professor, he says the enabling power of grace is only as effective as one's obedience to their covenantal commitments. So it's only uh, God's enabling power, his, his grace is only as effective as your obedience is. Um, and, uh, and again, that, that poses some problems. And so let's move on to, that's some, some of the background. If any of that was unclear, um, don't tell me it'll hurt my feelings, but uh, no, no, you can, you, can, you can come after and, and ask for anything that, uh, if anything was unclear on that. Um, I want to talk to you about then a, 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 a way to, I think, help uh, us share the gospel kind of with some of this background stuff in mind. How much time do I have? 30 minutes. You have, well, I mean now. You have, uh, did I burn through all of my time on that? Or? Yeah. Oh, man, I got time. That was good. That was a new record for that. Sweet. That was a new record. You guys are a great audience, just nodding and smiling. Usually it's smaller groups, and so, uh, you know, there's questions and things, but there's too big of a group who can't do questions, and so I can just talk, and you don't have anything you can't. It's like a train ride. You're just stuck. It's, great. Um, it's like unconditional grace. <laughs> exactly. Sharing the gospel. 
So these, uh, this first question is not mine. This is something I learned from uh, Mormonism Research Ministries. This is a question they ask, Randy and, and, and Eric and others. I'm not sure who first thought of it, but this is a question I use a lot. If you're going to, the hardest part about, if you've, if, for me, I'm guessing this is pretty common, the hardest part about, about sharing the, the gospel with somebody, especially on the streets of Manti or something like that, is just getting a conversation started. And so this is a question I use a lot. It's a question I learned from others that you guys are welcome to use, but uh, you can use anything you want. But here's one that works for me, and it kind of plays into how I might um, navigate this sort of a conversation. <coughs> But I'll ask, what, I'll ask somebody, are you, are you LDS? They'll say, yeah, yeah. What's the best part about being Mormon for you? Which is a very easy question. What's the best part about being Mormon? Well, I'll tell you about that. And typically, there's a couple different answers they'll give you about their family being forever or the restored priesthood. or you know, They'll give you some sort of spiel. Typically, there's you know, two or three things that are pretty common. But what's the best part about being Mormon? It's a very easy question to ask, very easy question to answer. And, uh, and it leads into... Um, me, after, after I give them time to share, to share whatever they want to share, I ask them the question, well, can I share with you the best part about being an evangelical Christian with you? Can I share with you the best part about being a Christian? However you want to say that. And typically, if they've already answered, they've already given you their answer, they're going to be you know, at least open enough to hearing you share uh, the, the best thing that, that you have about being a Christian. And that's when I'll talk about the fact that as a Christian, I can know that I have eternal life with God. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, an amazing thing that we have, right? And t sometimes if they're open enough and they have a Bible or I have a Bible, I can share 1 John 5, 11 to 13 with them or something like that. Um, but we can talk about that, that, uh, that I can know that I have eternal life because that, that, the eternal life that God gives is a gift that I receive through faith. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And, uh, and, and uh, typically... Uh, you know, you can, you can, there's different ways that that might go, but if you have 1 John 5, you might look at that. You might ask them, you know, uh, different questions. This, but let me just tell you how uh, I think this, this works in this conversation about grace. Typically, after I share that, I'll ask you, can I share with you a passage from the life of Abraham that, uh, that I think really highlights this, uh, uh, this truth for me? And, 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 and it's, for whatever reason, starting in the Old Testament seems to be um, somewhat, it's like neutral ground for them because a lot of the contested kind of passages are found in Paul's writing or something like that. For some reason, talking about Abraham and, and the Old Testament is a little bit more like neutral ground. And, and they're actually a little, sometimes a little bit surprised that, that you would find evidence for this, uh, this knowing that I can have eternal life with God because of the gift that he gives me uh, in, in, in the life of Abraham. And so sometimes they're even a little bit intrigued by that. And so typically... Unless the person's just on their way somewhere and, and they just don't have time, typically, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look. And uh, so can I share that with you? Sure, okay. So you, you open up and um, you're going to turn to uh, Genesis 15, 6 and following. Anyone have your Bible on you? You can, you can turn to Genesis 15, 6 for me. Who's got that? You got, can you read that real loud for us? And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This verse is um, fantastic, and the LDS person is going to have a really hard time understanding it right now. Uh, but it's great to kind of lay the foundation, read that verse, and then, and then skip down a few to uh, Genesis 15, 12. And uh, let's see, how far do we want to go? I've got probably 8 minutes, 12 minutes left. 20 minutes or so. And, uh, and so uh, if someone else can read, uh, starting just a couple of verses down lower, start at verse 12 and, um, and read, let's say, uh, I don't, we don't have to read all the way. Let's read 12 and then you can kind of skip down a little bit. You can read the whole thing if you're there with a the person, but read verse 12 and then read verse 17. Um, let's just do that. 12 and 17. Who can read verse 12 and 17? I would read the whole thing with them if they're, if they're standing there with you. But, uh, but 12 and 17 are great ones. Anyone who's got that? Yeah, can you read that for us nice and loud? As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then in verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. 
Now, the interesting thing, if you read through 21, when the ceremony is over, are you guys familiar with the whole covenant deal and, and how those were enacted? Um, you can write a little note in your Bible, Jeremiah 34, 18, if you'd like, which gives you a little bit, of, a little bit extra context on this. But what you would do is you would, uh, you would, you would tear an animal apart. And you, uh, both people, you know, this is sort of like you'd both walk through the animal and it was, it was a statement saying, be it unto me as it is to this animal if I don't hold up my end of this covenant. So it's a little bit like you're going to sign this contract in blood, you know, but it's, it's someone else's, it's this animal's blood. Um, and Jeremiah uh, 34 talks about uh, God holding people accountable for that and saying, I'm going to make you like those animals that we, you know, we made the covenant kind of thing and you guys haven't been living up. My, my friends and I in college used to do this with, uh, if we were going to like, if you're going to make a, a deal with someone, um, some of my roommates in college, we'd take a, a, a Cheerio and we would each bite one in half and say, be it unto me as it is to this O if I don't uphold my, my uh, so we, we, you know, then we had to take their word very seriously at that point, you know. It was like one step beyond pinky swearing. And, um, but anyway, they're going to do this kind of covenant, this covenant ritual and they're both going to walk through the animals. Uh, but what happened in verse 12? What happened to Abraham? He fell asleep. Right? God, God made it so that he could not. And this is interesting. He was absolutely unable to walk through the covenant. So, but, but what did walk through the covenant? What did we see that smoking fire pot? And it's interesting because in the Bible, it's not an unclear message. But God, by a pillar of cloud and, and, uh, and a pillar of fire in the cloud, uh, oftentimes God is symbolized by fire and cloud. And here, now you have the smoking fire pot that's walking through or that's, that's going through the, the animals. And so what does that mean? So I'll ask the question, uh, I'll ask the question who, who, do you, who did you notice in this covenant, this covenant ritual, who did not walk through the animals? So we'll, we'll, and, and, and I will pause as long as it takes for them to answer and really do that. Don't, you've got to let, you've got to let the, the, sometimes the passage speak. And so who, does, who doesn't pass through here? Right, that's the easier question. Who doesn't pass through? Um, Abraham doesn't pass through. So God is making a covenant with Abraham. And, and this covenant... Uh, does not include Abraham walking through it. It's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, what do you think that means? Interesting just to hear their thoughts on that. What do you think that means? God does all the work. Amen. Amen. Um, and then you can, then you can, uh, you can go on and, and ask them, you know, what do, what do you, uh, re, you can reread Genesis 15, 6 if you like. Um, you can ask them who, 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 and then you can ask also, uh, who does pass through, right? That's another question you can ask. Who does pass through? The, uh, God is symbolized by that, that fire pot, smoking fire pot walks through. So God uphold, God's making covenant and he's saying, only I am on the hook for this. It's my responsibility to keep this covenant. Um, now what you want to do is, if you, if you kind of get those, those two things established, that God is on the hook for this covenant and Abraham is not. Right? You want to look at Romans chapter 4, 1 through 5. So let's turn, someone turn to, to Romans 4, 1 through 5 and, and read that for me. Someone raise your hand if you can, if you can do that. You got it for me? Thanks, man. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something. So go to that next slide. The, the verse is up there. I'm sure it's easier to read. Is that my time? Five minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> when you even get to the end, that would be tragic. We don't know. What happens to Abraham? I don't know. Um, so he makes, he makes it really clear at this point. Like, look, uh, did Abraham have anything to boast about? If he, and, he, and Paul says, like, look, if Abraham had done something to merit this covenant, to merit his upholding of the covenant, then, then he'd have something to boast about before God. But he does not have anything to boast about. What does the scripture say? And he quotes 15.6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him. It was counted to him as righteousness. 
Uh, and then he says, uh, the, but the one who does not work but believes in him who, unjust, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. He justifies the ungodly. For me to understand my own justification, the problem with that or the offensiveness is I have to understand I'm ungodly, first of all. But, but what a great news that God does uh, justify the ungodly. Uh, it's not a wage. It's, a, it's it, all that. So you can, you can talk to about that. I'm going to kind of hurry along here a little bit. Um, we can ask, does Paul see Abraham's standing before God as a wage he earned or a gift he received? Uh, how, do, how, does, how does Abraham get that? And at this point, it should be somewhat innocuous at some level because I'm, we're just talking about Abraham. I'm not talking about you and I yet, right? I'm just talk, we're just talking about Abraham and, 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 and uh, understanding. And a lot of time, I will tell you this, this is just... Most LDS people will interpret Genesis 15 through the lens of Genesis 22. They, they will see Abraham's um, uh, uh, obedience with his son Isaac and the sacrificing of his son as a work he does that gets him into the covenant or that shows his... Uh, that, that, uh, that he'll obey enough to get the covenant or something like that. And it's really important that if that happens, and I say that that's, that'll happen because I, I sat through, I went to the seminary classes, I, go to, I went to the institute uh, and, and sat through their Old Testament class. And um, their Old Testament class is essentially a way for them to talk about the book of Abraham and how it changes what the Bible's about. But that's where they go with it. They say, and they, they look at Abraham, they look at his life in Genesis 22, and they say, well, look at that, there's his obedience, and so that's why God makes a covenant with him, because he's so obedient. And I remember raising my hand and asking the teacher, well, isn't it sort of instructive that Genesis 15 happens, like, prior to 22? And, and uh, you know, he would, that's an interesting thought, let's move on. And, uh, <laughs> um, so it is important. It's in their manual as well. If you read the manual for uh, the, the uh, Genesis, the Old Testament manual, student manual that they put out, it talks about uh, his obedience as sort of a foundational point of the covenant. When, when in reality, 15, again, just doing the math, comes way before 22. But uh, did, did Abraham see a standing before God as a wage he earned or gift he received? Uh, it's a great, great uh, place for them. Again, it's, it's innocuous because we're just talking about Abraham. But then once we get that clear, then we look at just a, a couple verses down. And I'm really getting low on time. So someone read this for me real fast. Romans 4. Or just go to the next slide for me. Uh, I'll read it for you. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. Praise God. I added the praise of God part. But it's not, it wasn't just for Abraham that God went through all that. What was it for? This is for our sake. Because it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised uh, from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. He was delivered from my sins. He was raised for my justification so that when I trust in him and I believe in him... <laughs> And that same, that same benefit of, 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 uh, of unearned favor is mine. That I'm, is counted to me as righteousness when I trust in Him. Uh, this then is very different way of dealing with my sins than the conditional way that they try to deal with it. Through obedience and through... And, you, and, and if it goes down on that road, I, you can go to the Apostle Gospel and show them how, how impossible that is. But my hope is that in walking through this, that, that they see how, how difficult that is, but they also see how we have a different kind of grace. It's unconditional. It's based not on my ability to, to, to do good works, but on God's promises and His commitment to me through Christ and Him crucified. That, that if we're able to demonstrate that and help them see those differences clearly enough, then at least they can make the choice. Like Galatians 1, 8, and 9. They can sort of say, okay, well now these are two different Gospels, and if I can see these are two different Gospels, then I need to make a choice about that. The problem is so often they think that we're talking about the same kind of grace, the same sort of good news. They just have extra revelation added on to it. And they have a priesthood and they have new authority or whatever. But it's the same kind of basic. This helps us, I hope, show, no, no, this is a whole different gospel message. This is a gospel of grace and it's not a conditional kind of grace, which isn't grace at all. It's, grace is more than an enabling power. It is what saves me from my sins and, and delivers me and justifies me, an ungodly person. And, and hopefully uh, you know, as we pray and we interact that they see that as a, as a different message enough to where God's Spirit can begin working on them to hear the gospel in a new way. So hopefully that's uh, something helpful uh, for you guys. Um, 
Okay? I'll tap out it there. Thanks.